Welcome everyone to this limited series I'm calling A Deeper Analysis. Every few months I will choose a movie to do an in-depth analysis of. As I just recently did my Let's Talk on The Force Awakens, I thought it would be good to continue with it. That said, I'll be doing videos like this for films other than Star Wars movies, so don't worry if you're not that interested in Star Wars, I may explore a film you like in the near future. With that out of the way, let's get started. This will be broken up into two main categories that are critical to any Star Wars film, that being the writing and action and music. I would include directing, but in the case of this movie there isn't much to discuss. It is important to note that I'm not analysing this film in relation to its sequel, The Last Jedi, or the novelization, as that would introduce new errors and also fix some present. The Force Awakens script was written by director J.J. Abrams, Lawrence Kasdan, and Michael Arndt. An original script was written by George Lucas prior to selling Lucasfilm and Star Wars to Disney, but it was never used. Michael Arndt, writer of Toy Story 3, Little Miss Sunshine, and more, left the project due to commitments. It's evident that he wanted to explore a similar story to that of George Lucas, which included following the offsprings of Luke, Han, and Leia. This leaves J.J. Abrams and Lawrence Kazan as the two core writers of this film. And from a writing standpoint, this film is good. The characters for the most part are enjoyable, but it is evident that this film is written by fans and not creative filmmakers with a story to tell. This film is paying an homage to the first ever Star Wars film, A New Hope. That said, it often comes off more as a copy than an homage. Story beats are blatantly taken from A New Hope and characters clearly substitute others from previous stories. And while it may sound like I dislike this, I don't. This writing was necessary for the release of the film. Sadly, it worsens the film in the long run. There is the possibility that this film, like the prequel trilogy, will gain more fans in future years as the issues are fixed when expanded material comes out or when people just forgive the creators for their errors. An important note before I start examining scenes from the film, I will not be exploring every line of dialogue or writing in a scene but focusing on main parts and themes. The first part of the writing to analyse is the opening crawl. Opening with Luke Skywalker has vanished is great. It leads with a sense of intrigue on the fans part Stating that the First Order arose from the ashes of the Empire is also good, but then the problems start to arise. Luke Skywalker is the last Jedi. How is Luke the last Jedi when this film takes place 30 years after the return of the Jedi? And in that film, Luke became a Jedi after defeating Vader and the Sith. It implies that within the gap of 30 years, Luke failed to train a new generation of Jedi. Questions arise as to why this is the case. Unlike Luke vanishing, this seems illogical based on the previous movie, and while it is explained later on in the movie that he did start a Jedi Academy but was betrayed by one of his Padawans, it is not a sufficient amount of reasoning to give for this 30 year gap. It's telling us what happened instead of showing us what happened. As the text crawl continues, viewers learn of the existence of the established New Republic. Surprisingly, a resistance exists. Resisting what exactly? Viewers can guess that it's the First Order, but if a Republic exists, why does the Resistance exist? A simple line stating that the Republic is unwilling to fight or don't have a large military would fix this problem, but the writers clearly didn't think it through. They simply wanted to create the same situation that the characters were in in the original trilogy. Leia searches for Luke to restore peace and justice to the galaxy. Peace and justice? A Republic governs the galaxy, but there is no peace or justice in the galaxy. How could the First Order rise to such power to cause unrest without being defeated within the last 30 years? If the Republic supports the Resistance, why does the Resistance exist? If the Resistance isn't short on money and support, why don't they have enough resources to easily wipe out an independent faction? These simple questions were ignored when writing this film simply to create the situation desired by JJ and Lawrence. The crawl ends with Leia sending her most daring pilot on a secret mission on Jakku to find Luke's whereabouts. It's important to remember this and I'll get into it later. The opening scene begins with great symbolism of Finn's troop transport exiting the Star Destroyer just before it blocks the light from the above moon. It's clearly representing Finn being a light in an otherwise dark organisation. Sadly, the First Order being here makes no sense since Poe was sent on a secret mission 
And if the First Order knew the map to Skywalker was on Jakku, and in this specific village, the location of the map clearly wasn't such a big secret. Poe isn't surprised when he sees the First Order arrive, which doesn't help the film. Then comes a later scene of what I call forced exposition. I'm not talking about Poe and Law Senteca, but Kylo Ren and Law Senteca. Kylo Ren says, You know what I've come for. Law Senteca replies, I know where you come from, before you called yourself Kylo Ren. He continues later on, The First Order rose from the dark side, you did not. Further saying, You cannot deny the truth, that is your family. What forced unemotional dialogue. This isn't an intense interrogation, but a simple conversation between two people on opposing sides. It's so jarring and poorly written to reference A New Hope. Luke learns about his father and the Force and even what drives the plot through Obi-Wan. There's a sense of intrigue and wonder in what is being told. It doesn't come across as two people saying information to one another for the benefit of the audience like it does in The Force Awakens. Returning to the scene, Kylo kills Law Senteca out of nowhere and without getting the map or any information out of him. Why did he do this illogical move? To move the plot along and kidnap Poe so he can be broken out by Finn. As Poe is captured, the dialogue does shine. Poe is easily the, one of the best newly written characters in this movie, and while his return to the film later on is jarring, it's not as bad from a writing perspective when considering other issues in this film. More on this later. During the same opening, we see FN2187 aka Finn as he works under the First Order. He witnesses his comrade get shot and die. Struggling with this event, he finds himself in a state of panic. The execution of this is great, and the concept explored is a brilliant one, but it is ruined by dialogue later in the film. Finn's turn away from the First Order is a very short turn. For a man in his mid-twenties who was raised by the First Order since he was roughly 5 years of age, Finn easily turns his back on the First Order. Within roughly 10 minutes, Finn goes from being unable to do the one thing he was raised to do, as he says later in this movie, I was raised to do one thing, and although he says he worked in sanitation, it's implied that wasn't the one thing he was raised to do. Killing was. But the writers failed to remember what was in their own script. He goes from being a part of the First Order, and working with what he could essentially recognize as brothers or close friends, to killing them without remorse. As a stormtrooper of the First Order, Finn would have been raised in a strict, dictator-like environment, where he is even restricted in taking his helmet off. He's spoken down to by his commanding officer, Captain Phasma. He was taken from a family when he was roughly 5 years of age and raised to do one thing. Yet, when he runs away from the First Order, he cracks jokes and is very expressive. Except for when he needs to remind people that he's running away. It's not how a soldier raised from birth would react. It may be true that he is experiencing many new things, but it's too comedic for a person described as having a rough background, and doesn't come off as a new experience for him. He even witnesses a close comrade die, and roughly a day later, tries to kill another comrade in one-on-one -on -one combat, disregarding the lives of people who are most likely in the same situation as him. He shows no remorse in killing them. How could such a great concept, like a stormtrooper being more than a faceless soldier, be so poorly written? J.J. Abrams and Lawrence Kasdan had the Clone Wars animated series to refer to, which gave development to various clone troopers. I emphasize clone, as they are all, with an exempt few, genetically identical, yet so different through how they developed during the series. The death of the members from Domino's squad, Captain Rex, Commander Cody, Fives, Wolves, Gregor and more are core memorable parts of the series and shows how the idea explored in Finn should have been explored in a novel or series instead of this film. Finally, we're introduced to Rey and she is well set up as we see her by herself on a planet where she clearly doesn't belong, destined for more. Her living on her own, surviving on her own and being so mesmerized by the ideas of pilots are so well done. Her introduction as a scavenger clearly shows how she has a good understanding of ships and how they function. The tally she keeps of how long she's been on Jakku is also great at showing how she waits for something or someone, how she believes there's more out there for her. Sadly, the overall character basically copies Luke's character from A New Hope in his isolation, location, 
skills with a vehicle and lack of knowledge about the wider galaxy. Ray often gets into difficult to escape situations, but manages to move past them with little to no stress. The first example of this is when Ray manages to pilot the Millennium Falcon, which she states hasn't flown in years, and helps takes out two First Order TIE Fighters. Her piloting skills are shown off here, but before this scene, she was never shown off to be a skilled pilot, but a mechanic of sorts. Yes, some may say that the Force is guiding her, similarly to how it guided Anakin in The Phantom Menace when he took part in the pod race as a child. However, that film established how Anakin would need Jedi-like reflexes to be a human and survive being in a pod race. Audiences also knew that Anakin was Force-sensitive. Unlike Rey, whose marketing promoted her as not being Force-sensitive, the film also gives no sign to her using the Force during the scene. The second instance when Rey gets out of a somewhat difficult situation is when she lets out the Rathars on Han's ship, but then saves Finn with little difficulty. The poor writing in the scene is even more evident when the creatures decided not to eat Finn straight away like he did with the other people, but instead drag him around the ship for no reason until Rey can save him. In this situation, Rey simply finds controls to save Finn and doesn't undergo a struggle to help him. The third instance of this occurs on Starkiller Base, when Rey is captured by Kylo Ren and manages to block Kylo from her mind and even reads his, as well as using a mind trick on a stormtrooper without any training or understanding of the Force. Without any explanation or sort of reasoning, Rey is able to get herself out of being captured and doesn't need the help of Finn, Han and Chewie, the three of which came to save her. A similar problem arises during her lightsaber fight with Kylo. Kylo states that he can show her the ways of the Force, and Rey instantly taps into the Force and gains the strength required to beat an injured Kylo. Put simply, she's ridden to experience the wonder of the universe for the first time, but manages to overcome every challenge she faces. It's a blatant contradiction. Those challenges related to ships are fine, as it's an established skill she has. It doesn't matter if it's the Millennium Falcon, Han Solo was never good at fixing it, just look at the Empire Strikes Back, so it's fine if Rey does. The issues focus more on her skills with the Force, without a lack of training or guidance by one with knowledge about the Force, as well as the few negative consequences her choices have. Her arc is to find somewhere where she belongs, and at the end of the movie that is essentially found with Luke. Take the journey part out of this arc, and there is no substance but a bland character written to do whatever is necessary to make her a strong, innocent character, a Mary Sue. The main antagonist of the film, Kylo Ren aka Ben Solo, is fairly well written. He's not meant to be an imposing villain, as Snoke is meant to fill that role. His obsession over Vader is an interesting idea, but falls flat as questions are raised as to why Anakin's Force Ghost doesn't appear to guide his misguided grandson. Although some may find his tantrums to be childish, it works within the parameters this film establishes. As stated earlier, Kylo is not meant to be an imposing villain. He's more emotionally driven and appealing in that sense. Audiences will find him more compelling than Rey as he is crafted in a way that viewers feel sympathy for him. He shows struggles, pain and emotion over problems he faces. All characteristics of a compelling protagonist. Accompanying Kylo Ren is General Hux. He's an imposing leader and written to be an equal to Kylo, despite his lack of physical power. This is evident in the scene where he comes to Snoke and Kylo looks away in shame as he does not wear his mask. It's clear Hux's power come from his knowledge and tactical skills. His speech before the firing of Starkiller's base is intense and intimidating. Pairing it with the continued symbolism of the Nazi regime is wonderful. Every scene which contains Hux and Kylo is entertaining and well written with little to no errors. His competitive nature with Kylo is compelling and allows for an interesting dynamic that could have been further explored in sequels. The imposing villain of the film is Supreme Leader Snoke. He was a character that created much speculation as to his origin and how he came into power after the demise of Palpatine's empire. Many people wanted this question solved and this helps add an audience interest to the film. Like much of the film, many intriguing questions were raised, with little information given to keep the audience wanting more. This is essentially all that surrounds Snoke as a character in this film. He's projected as a large and imposing being to help depict his strength, but beyond that, he's a generic boss. 
The worst villain in this film is Captain Phasma. She was in so much promotional material, but in the film, she's only in it for a few minutes. It is a huge waste of actress Gwendolyn Christie, and having her on tour for the movie makes her lack of being in the movie worse. She was simply created to sell toys and have a strong female character. She had potential to be an excellent rival for Finn, but in the end of the movie, she gets tackled by Chewie and lowers the shield instead of dying. Finn has a gun to her head, and instead of killing the person that treated him poorly as we saw at the start of the film, he chooses to throw her into the trash compactor. It allows her to stay alive for the sequel, but makes her an even more pathetic character. It's similar to Boba Fett and Darth Maul, where a cool looking character was underwhelming, although Darth Maul was in what is arguably the best scene from the movie he was in, unlike Phasma. Moving away from characters, one of the biggest issues when it comes to the writing in this film is its MacGuffin. For those that don't know, a MacGuffin is a plot device which essentially serves no real purpose in the film but to drive the plot. When done well, a MacGuffin is acceptable and at times unnoticeable. Examples include The Case from Pulp Fiction and Rosebud from Citizen Kane. The Force Awakens focuses on characters trying to obtain the map to Luke Skywalker, yet the goal suddenly shifts to a different objective in blowing up Starkiller Base leaving the map to be forgotten until the final moments of the film. The film also fails to explain why the map was made in the first place. The film has another jarring moment when R2 conveniently wakes up with the rest of the missing map. It comes off as him just booting up so that the plot regarding the map can conclude and yes I am aware that the writers explain these issues outside of the movie but when you have to explain a central piece of your movie with an outside comment you're covering up poor writing. While we're talking about it, let's talk about Starkiller Base. As a concept, it's good. It's more powerful than the Death Star and serves as a good location for the finale. It is a beautiful location, an improvement over previous antagonist weapons, and well introduced in the film. That said, there are a few issues. The opening text says that the Republic supports the Resistance, so you'd imagine that the Resistance would have a few dozen ships of varying designs and capabilities, but they don't. Even with the support of the reigning government, the resistance appears to only have 12 X-Wings or so, available for the attack on Starkiller base. I'm pretty sure they also lose half of their force in the attack. How could a militia with the support of the reigning government be so poorly armed? There's no explanation except for poor writing. On Starkiller base, we also witness Han's death. And it was telegraphed, and that's not a bad thing, but it was emotionally powerful. The symbolism of the light from the sun fading as Ben Solo makes his decision is visually amazing and perfectly sets up the act to come. Yes, it would have been better for fans to see Luke, Han and Leia reunite on screen, but it's not poor writing to kill Han. The poor writing regarding Han's death comes from after the destruction of Starkiller Base, when Leia embraces Rey instead of Chewie. Chewie literally walks right past Leia and it's obvious that they ignore one another as Chewie covers half of the screen as Leia stands still. J.J. Abrams and Kazdan cared way too damn much about their new character, heck not even character but the Mary Sue of Rey, so much more than to have a more suitable embrace between two longtime friends. Heck I'm sure Chewie was like an uncle to Ben Solo. If the writers were consistent with their own story, it would make more sense for Rey to go off with Finn instead of Chewie, as she clearly cares a great deal about him. Their chemistry throughout the film was delightful, and the banter the two share is that of best friends and possible love interests. I'm aware that JJ said that he made a mistake about this scene, but it doesn't change the fact that it was poorly written. It's good to acknowledge this one error, although many others are ignored, but this moment is a clear representation of the writers and producers of this film, lacking the care required for the Star Wars franchise. One aspect that was maintained from the previous Star Wars films was that of comedy. The comedy in this movie is great. Finn is funny although it does not suit the idea of his character, that being a hardened soldier that knows nothing of life beyond that in a military. It's always entertaining to watch him on screen, and a large part of that is because of John Boyega, the actor that plays him. He works the poor character writing into an entertaining and enjoyable character. I can't help but smile every time he makes the forced joke on Starkiller base. The banter between Han and Chewie is also great. It feels like two best buds of the Star Wars universe have not changed. 
Some may complain about Han being surprised by the power of Chewbacca's bowcaster, and a line of dialogue explaining how Chewie could have possibly upgraded his weapon for the capturing of Rathdars would explain this, but sadly none of it is given. Nonetheless, it's not enough to take away from the positive, entertaining banter. Finally, I'm going to talk about the final scene of the film, that of Luke Skywalker on Octo. One of the scenes from the script which I read was this, and it is so well written. The writing describes the planet as perfectly as it is displayed on screen. The writing describes Rey walking through the island, climbing higher and higher. It describes her seeing no one, sensing no one. The writing shows glimmers of the force within her as it guides her. As the writing continues, Luke is revealed. He is described to have kindness but torture in his eyes. He is described as knowing why Rey is here and after she holds out his lightsaber, he looks amazed but conflicted. It's a climax with the promise of an epic journey. As the script says, an adventure just beginning. The writing and execution of the scene is beautiful. It's short but conveys a moment to remember throughout Star Wars history. After analyzing sections and arcs from the writing of The Force Awakens, it's evident that there are many issues present in the script. J.J. Abrams and Lawrence Kasdan failed to create a story that justified making the ending of Return of the Jedi redundant. The film is in no way poor, but simply fine. Its saving grace was that the errors or arcs could be rectified or explained in its sequel. Or maybe not. I feel is truly progressive. We relate to Captain Phasma not through that random group of elements that causes us to look a certain way in flesh. We relate to her due to her actions and her character. And her character. And her character. 